But back, we're live. This is Global Correlations uh, with Carl Baker, Senior Advisor for Pacific Forum. We're going to talk about an article and a concept in the Atlantic uh, by a fellow named Paul Post. It's not a world war, he says. It's a world of wars or something along those lines. He's trying to tell us something. What is he trying to tell us, Carl? Well, I think he's trying to tell us that the 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 order that we thought was so firmly in place since 1945 may not be so firmly in place as what we thought and that and that there are edges that are seem to be coming loose on that on that global global order. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been thinking about it too, not in the, not in the sophisticated terms that he describes in that article which you can find anybody can find on the web uh, Atlantic and it's uh, it's called uh, not not a world war but a world of wars um it's um it's i've been thinking about all the places and every time i talk to you i learn about more of them where there are skirmishes going on <laughs> that's that's a too, much too lighthearted a term people are dying in wars mm -hmm. all over the world and and i i ticked them off when i when i wrote the show up and uh, maybe it's of some use to uh, just um, see if we agree about all these places. So I'll just list some of them here. Of course, there's Ukraine. There's the Middle East, uh, Serbia, Kosovo, Kosovo, um, Syria, Yemen, Eastern Congo, Sudan, French Equatorial Africa, Ethiopia. There's more coming up all, all the time. Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and um, Azerbaijan, Haiti already. China and Taiwan, big one, Korea, and there's more. I know I missed three or four of them. And so um, we have the, the, the big powers uh, are really not stopping these things. And he argues, Post argues, that if the big powers are in competition, you know, and trying to look after their own interests, they're actually facilitating these wars, um, encouraging them, st stimulating them. And um, there's nobody out there that, actually acts as a you know a global mediator the un certainly doesn't the us is stepping away from that has been stepping away from it uh russia would like to do it but russia does it in a, a very destructive way and china is always self-interested so you know who who is going to step in on this tasmania well no i think you know i think that's that's the problem is that no one is stepping in, but I want to go back and and review the the history a little bit here. When you look at it from beginning in 1945, which is where he tries to start, saying that this 1945 post World War II there was there was relative calm and relative peace. But I think that that is in is itself misleading. You know, if you look back uh, some of the some of the uh, sites websites out there that talk about these things, like the Cornell. Peace Studies Institute says 41 million people have died since 1945. You know, and the big chunks, of course, are the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the the Chinese, the Chinese Civil War. You know, which accounts for six six million six million of those 41 million. You know, Africa, Southeast Asia. You know, all the all the big places in the world have had wars since 1945. I think the difference. To in today's world, and what Post is talking about is that states are again becoming more involved. Where the wars that I'm talking about were were yes, somewhat led by states, but for the most part, they were civil wars. They were war internal wars. They were war post colonial wars where they were where they were fighting for for control of specific countries. And and you know in Africa, it, there's there's a, a rich history of of unrest based on post-colonial order. Southeast Asia, there's a, there's a number of wars, don't forget, in, in Indonesia, uh, in larger Indochina, in, in the post-colonial era. So, you know, so, so these wars have been going on and people have been dying, but it's, it's only recently that we've had this reemergence of, of the big states getting involved in wars. And I think that's, that's really what's happening. And it's, a, and it's I think, a function of of the deterioration of this mindset that the United States as the global leader can prevent wars 
between between states. And that while, yes, we have civil wars, you know, these are sort of remote and we don't really understand them very well. So, yeah, there's a few million people that die in Rwanda, but that's OK because it's Rwanda and, and it doesn't matter to to the rest of the world in some ways. You know, I think that's been sort of the mindset over the 60s, 70s and 80s. Is part of this a question of, you know, awareness? I mean, for example, if something happened in a, say, a civil war somewhere in a remote area that we don't care about ordinarily in 1953, um, just picking that year, uh, we may not have heard about it. And certainly mm-hmm. if we heard about it, it would be on page six. Um, but now um, it's part of that raw meat theory that the press goes by and if it if it bleeds, you put it up at the top, yeah. and we we get it all at the top of our uh, headline um, uh, headlines. Is is it a matter of media awareness too? Uh, it, it certainly is a matter of of uh, if it's media awareness or if it's just the access to information through social media. I think maybe more accurate to to describe it as as that. I think is the new phenomenon. Where you know now Gaza isn't just remote anymore, but Gaza is real because I can see it on my phone because other people are are taking pictures or taking taking video of things that are happening on the ground today. So I think it's it's so much more up close and personal that you can you can see it, you know, and and that's I think a function of social media being able to penetrate into the deepest corners of the world, where in the past. You know, if it wasn't on ABC or CBS or NBC in the United States, you didn't see it. Yeah. So what about, you know, the the lack of uh, American interest, American influence, American hegemony um, around the world? We, You know, I I don't think anybody would disagree that we've lost our our soft power, Uh, maybe not our hard power, but our soft power. And, And as a result, um, people don't care what we do if we don't if we don't do something kinetic. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm not sure how to respond to that because I, you know, I, I certainly there is a tendency in the United States to respond kinetically. You know that that that's always the solution to to any problem. You know, it goes back to the old aphorism, aphorism of you know if if you. If, if all you have, have in your hand is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail, you know, and, and really that's to say that, that because the Defense Department and, and military responses have become so uh, integral to American responses, there's a tendency to see the world that way, that, that everything requires a, if it doesn't require a military response, then it probably isn't very important. You know, I think that that's, that's sort of the mindset that's, that's become too much of an American approach to to international affairs. But I mean, I, I want to go back and I want to talk again about the global South, this, this amorphous orga, organization of states of people that are losing, that see the hypocrisy in the Western liberal order. And by that, what I mean is, you know, they, they see themselves being forced to support the Western view of the world, but they get nothing out of it. There's no, there's no real benefit that they see. They have to forego economic opportunity for the sake of of promoting the the global Western global order. But there's no real benefit that they see, and I think that's probably more important to what we see happening today than anything. That you have this resistance from from the African countries, from the Middle Eastern countries to the idea that oh we need to be really careful here and we need to support american involvement and european involvement because we need to support the the, the rules based order and they're saying well rules for who and by who at this point i think and i think that, so i think that that's really a, a fundamental part of what's happening when we talk about loss of american influence is is people around the world i think that again this this somewhat amorphous global south sees this this loss of of capacity of the west to actually control events and that there's something else going on and and then on top of that you have this this movement towards nationalism in the west you know so for example in europe you know now the the, the big news of course is the netherlands 
you know, that, that suddenly we have a, a populace that has taken control of, of about a third of the uh, parliament in, in the Netherlands. You know, you have Hungary with, uh, with, with uh, a, a, a strong populace controlling Hungary. And you have movements in Germany and, and uh, Poland, you know, that, that are looking like the, 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 the somewhat fascist movements, the nationalist movements are back in Europe. And you have what's happening in the United States, where you have this this great turning inward uh, in in the United States, where it's all becoming self interest. You say China. You pointed out earlier China it has has always looks very self interested whenever it comes across and says, "Well, we don't involve ourselves with external with other people's affairs," you know. But we certainly look out for Chinese interests in these in these conflicts. So you know. So I think that that's the other part of it is. Number one, you have the global South sort of looking at at the West, saying you guys aren't really fulfilling your promises to us because we keep getting the short end here. And then you have the the, the West, the traditional West, looking in, looking at itself and turning inward, trying to trying to define what our national interests rather than what our global interests. Yeah, I don't know if you could say the United States is a leader in isolationism. But these days, you have to ask the question anyway. And that makes me wonder and ask you whether our turning inward, our isolationist views, and the political machinations that happen in Congress and the like, um, which are visible to the world, you know, which is the same thing you talked about before, about social media and awareness. And, you know, you, you pick up news that you wouldn't otherwise pick up. It's like the United States for all its... Uh, First Amendment, remaining First Amendment democracy, is visible to everyone, yeah. uh, everywhere. Every single person on the globe knows what goes on, you know, in our Congress and in our government. And, and um, you know, they can see that we're turning isolationist. And so my question to you is, does our isolationism provoke, encourage isolationism and self-interest in other places? I, I, cause and effect may be hard to come by, but I certainly see it as as causal on both sides. That that, that it, it feeds on itself. I think. I think. You know. I think just just as globalism feeds on itself, nationalism feeds on itself as well. And so, so it, certainly they look at the United States and they see. You know, they they go, going back to the Trump era and and America first. You know that that resonated around the world. That uh oh. Now we have this global leader who is suddenly saying, oh, no, no, we get to be first and make it very explicit that we're going to be first. It was always probably, you know, the, the theory of, of all boats rise uh, uh, mindset, where now it's all boats rise, but we don't really care about the other boats. We're going to make sure our rises, ours rises higher than everybody else's. I think, you know, that that it's, and certainly it feeds it, other people feed on. It, sure. Yeah. And I wonder, too. Um, oh, you know, what we are seeing and what uh, Paul Post saw, I think what we're talking about is a change in global attitudes. Um, and it's not just the attitude of the nation states. It's the attitude of the people. You know, if, if you want to, you know, get ahead, fight with someone, have a civil war, uh, go along with your government when it wants to attack your neighbor, um, that sort of thing. It's like uh, we don't really much care about the higher moral considerations anymore as a, as a, as a world, as a, a species, you know, pretty much, I would say everywhere, but it's getting to be everywhere. And, you know, and then I'm reminded of the, the old quote, you know, the way, I don't know who said this, the way to peace is through war. And, you know, and for the months and a couple of years after World War II, there was more peace um, because people had really had enough of killing. And of all the other effects that you know war visits on you, so I wonder what your thoughts would would be about this decline of the moral standard uh, globally of the species, if you will, and whether it, it could be true to say the way through the way to peace is through war, where you have a fresh memory of the horrible, you know, experiences in war. I, I'm going to resist that because I, I don't like the I don't like the idea 
to say that that you can't have peace without war that 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 one is a function of the other i, I just i just can't i just can't accept that i i mean i think I, I i i understand what you're saying but i again i think you know that that's a very that's a very narrow view of of the the impact of war on on populations certainly that was true in the early, in the late 40s early 50s in the, in europe but it wasn't true in asia remember this this was the era of the of the huge chinese civil war where where as i said earlier there 6 million people died in that war so so that, that certainly didn't have the impact in in asia that it did in europe if there if there was relative peace in europe it certainly wasn't true in 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 china and i don't think it was true in areas that were decolonizing at the time you know in southeast asia there was certainly a lot of turmoil africa there was certainly a lot of turmoil in that era so I, I I don't I don't know that that I want to make the relationship between war and peace as being you got to have a war to get peace. I think that that there has to be a a larger a larger picture a larger a larger a larger pursuit of of global good than than thinking that that there has to be there has to be conflict there has to be death in order to have peace. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree that the, the much better approach is to work hard. You have to work harder, you know, yeah. to, to stave off um, wars, all these various wars around around the world. Um, and, you know, query, are we, we working hard enough now? Because the natural progression, and I, I guess this is in, in, implicit in Post's uh, article, is that, you know, you can have all these spot wars all around, but ultimately it leads to a real mess. And whether the mess you would consider a world war or just a, a world of wars, it's not a pretty place because, because wars kill people and wars mm, destroy existing cultures and societies and possibilities of a reasonable life on the planet. And um, we, don't, you know, we don't realize, we, we're, not, we're not thinking historically in the sense that if you look back um, and see how a given war affected life on the planet or in that country going forward, you have to realize that the war had a huge effect on the people there. Not only were there, you know, people dying and families broken and um, culture undermined. And, you know, I suppose you could say that like every other major historic event, it, it changed things and it is an element in where we are today. But whether you can say that it changed things for the positive, I, I kind of doubt it. I think we'd all be better off if there were no war uh, and we yeah. would make more progress. Um, yeah, but I, you know, I, mean, I, I just think, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, I think that that's that's, I guess, ultimately the way we have to think about peace is is peace doesn't mean the absence of war. That's that's the tautology, obviously. You know, so we, we should really think mm -hmm. about how do you build peace? What is what is a culture of peace? Rather than rather than how do how do you respond to the to the latest uh, series of deaths, you know, and and I think that's where we where we as a as a as a planet we fall short, you know that that the the world the world as a whole has never really thought about what is it that would be beneficial for all the world, and I think that that's that's why you see you know this 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 uh, fragmentation that, that we're seeing now. In the world is that everybody has become much more self-centered, and and you know we as Americans are certainly guilty of that. That that we need to have our first, our our peace first, and then we'll worry about the rest of the world. You know, Africa, uh, that's a problematic area. Let's just kind of ignore that. You know, and the Middle East, uh, that let's you know just really let them kill each other. You know, that that'll probably get rid of all those problems that we see there. You know, and I think that that's what's really happening in the United States. That that we're 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 losing interest in trying to trying to be that leader, and 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 China, you know, China's approach is well, we'll we'll just not look at it. We'll just pretend that it doesn't exist. We'll take advantage of it to the extent that we can, and then and then be ben it'll be beneficial to China. It's ultimately a self-interested motivation to not get involved uh, in in it directly, but to to take advantage of whatever happens to fall out from it. 
And then you have you have the Russias of the world that see this as an opportunity to make itself bigger, to, to, to increase its, its influence in, in Europe, for example, with the, with the invasion of Ukraine. But, you know, I, um, people say, um, I, don't, I, I don't care what happens there. And then the answer to that is, wait a minute, you should care. I mean, people like, for example, you hear it all, all the time. You know, if you if you allow Russia to invade Ukraine, what's next? How about, you know, Western Europe? Don't you don't you realize, you know, the risk there? Or if you allow terrorism to breed in one area, you know, don't you think there'll there'll be another chapter soon where terrorism is in your neighborhood, which, I, you know, both are reasonable arguments. On the other hand, um, you know, people in isolationist mode don't. Don't think along those lines. Um, so I guess I'm asking, uh, Paul Post says we have a world of wars, but don't they connect? In other words, you can have all these spot wars. I don't want to read the list again. <laughs> yeah. The list too long. But those wars affect other places, right? And they connect. They, they blend. Uh, they have effect on other places and other wars. Maybe they Maybe they provoke other wars. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, is this not only a proliferating in terms of the number, that's what Post is saying, but also they, they, they have an effect on each other um, and, they, and they, they threaten us all. Sure. Yeah, they do. But, but again, you know, I, I guess it comes down to what is the solution to, to those wars? Is, is, the, uh, is the solution to stop the wars or is the solution to decide which wars should be fought and which wars shouldn't be fought. And, and to me, the answer has to be, we need to figure out why these wars are occurring and how do we, how do we prevent them from continuing? And yes, they're all connected. Yes, they, they certainly, when, when one place is at war, it's much easier for another place to say, hmm, this may be an opportunity for me to take advantage of this. That's what I'm trying to say with, with the self-interested Chinese approach. Is, is their vision of the world is, well, we'll just let these things play out and then take advantage of them as we can. But that doesn't work either. That's not the solution, is what I'm saying. But nor is the solution to go in and say, oh, we have to stop this war, so let's go kill some people on our own. Because that's not going to stop that either. And I think that's what's missing you know, in, in global governance today, is, is how do you stop wars? You know, the UN, as you said at the beginning of the show, has not proven itself to be very effective. It can go in and it can put in a UN mission in Africa somewhere or put in a UN mission somewhere where, where the Security Council happens to agree that it's it's worth doing that. But that's that doesn't seem to be a solution that's working. So now we have to figure out what does work, what can work. And I don't think we're 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 not even thinking along those lines. There's no there's no visible organization in this world today that is thinking along those lines. It's, it's, it's the Chinese approach of how do we take advantage of this, or the American approach of, well, where should we turn our, our military power today? And, and what, 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 what group should we, what should we try to eliminate in our effort to maintain this, this so-called liberal order? Well, boy, you are so right, Carl. I mean, it's absolutely right. That really resonates with me. You know, and in the days of a more perfect UN, you know, although they never really reached perfection, um, you had blue helmets. They would actually make a decision about who was right and who was wrong, a moral decision, and then they would enforce that decision. But they've lost all, all of that since, and that, largely because of the Security Council and the people on the Security Council. but also. It's the General Assembly. I think the General Assembly has also lost its, lost its way, uh, even without the problems on the Security Council. But theoretically, Carl, I mean, don't you really need an organization that is somehow, and not by virtue of an agreement, because, because humanity breaks agreements as fast as they make agreements, you know. Uh, watch what happens in the, in the ceasefire in, in uh, Israel. Watch. Um, but... Um, a, a, an organization which is more powerful than any of its members, an organization which is able both financially and and kinetically, um, you know, to uh, to enforce its decisions, and an organization which has the chutzpah to make decisions, moral decisions, 
and say, Russia, you're wrong, Ukraine, you're right. And unless you, you know, do this and that, we are going to have to come in with our blue helmets and rifles and whatever we need in order to enforce our moral decision. And P.S., I'd like to add one other thing before, before I let you loose on that. Um, you know, we hear all this about AI, okay? and we hear that AI can work for humanity and it can work against humanity. And I would say right now, just my observation, that it's more likely that AI works against humanity because AI, more and more, you read about weapons that are using AI all over the world. And there are, you know, we had weapons dealers a long time ago, hundreds of years ago, global weapons traffic. Um, but now we have AI traffic, which can be, you know, sent over the internet instantly. Um, and so anybody can develop weapons on it with using AI, that would be terrific. But AI is not being used, in my observation, for peace, only war. And uh, on the larger, more leveraged, you know, look at this, it seems to me that AI could help make those moral decisions. It it could, but I, I can't envision a world where that is going to happen anytime soon. Because I mean, you're 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 right. Well, I mean, I, I don't. I'm not sure I'm ready to in, enter a conversation about AI. But I mean, clearly, artificial intelligence is is very available. It's very accessible by people other than state actors, and and those those actors are going to act in self interest, just like a lot of states are going to act in self interest. So it's it's very difficult for me to see how you would ever be able to prevent bad act from taking advantage of artificial intelligence, much like we've seen bad actors taking advantage of trade, you know, of, of, of global trade. I mean, this, is, this has been the downfall of, of our, our fantasy that we were going to solve the global problems by improving global trade and everybody was going to be wealthy and, and uh, live a life of prosperity and peace. You know, I mean, bad actors take advantage of that and they use it for their own purposes. And I think AI is just another extension of that same problem, that, that we haven't figured out how to actually contain those good aspects of, of artificial intelligence in this case to do something for the greater good of humanity. Yeah. And so having said that, now I want to go back and talk a little bit about your idea that we need to have some organization. You know, I can I can hear people screaming at you saying we can't have global government. You can't have you can't have some some global body making decisions for all the states in this world. That's never going to work, Jay. You know that. You know, and I, I mean, I I, I, I can hear agree. them screaming. I can hear them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. So okay. So I'll, I'll I'll give them their 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 argument that you can't expect that. But certainly, we need to do something beyond the Security Council because that's not going to work. You can't have five governments making decisions for everybody. And, and the only way you're going to fix that is you're going to have to fix the UN more broadly. And you're going to have to figure out how to incorporate, how to integrate the larger part of the population where you can actually have some, some form of, 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 of political will to develop in an organization like the UN. And and that that has to involve some sort of critical mass, some sort of some some sort of democracy in in that organization, some sort of sense of the majority rules and an acceptance of that principle. But you can't. I don't think you can get there without without addressing this this gnawing issue of the rest of the world that always seems to be in a mode of accepting decisions by the great powers. You know, and, and and somehow you need to figure out how to how to integrate those populations, especially especially in today's world where you do have information out there. You know, if you look at it at what's happening, you know, with with information just in in general, you have you have the West which promotes free information, and then you have China which privileges the state to the exclusion of providing full information, and and this this competition. Is not is not equal at all because the United States and the West are always going to struggle with this this problem of too much information of, of information 
that can be deleterious or beneficial to their government. Where you have have China, Russia, and Iran, pick your pick your 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 authoritarian regimes, and they're they're working very hard to restrict information internally. But they look bad to the out from from the outside looking in. They look bad, but they look good internally. Their problem becomes how do you actually act when you don't have good information yourself? So their threat is always we're going to we're going to make mistakes because we don't understand what's really happening internally in in our country. The West, on the other hand, has the problem of we have so much information. How do how do we know when we should act? And we and we sort of almost become stymied by our own excess information where where the, the the russias and the chinas of the world are in a position of saying well we're going to act and we're confident we're right because we don't have information to tell us we're not right and so both sides are prone to mistakes but the mistakes look a lot different and right now what we're seeing is the mistakes being made by the west because of too much information of too much too much access to information if, if we had Xi Jinping on the program, he would he would totally agree, and he would say the Chinese system is better, and at the end of the day, they will prevail as a better system, and maybe he's right. Right, but but you but he he isn't going to know that until it's too late. Is is the point I'm making, <laughs> and and then he's going to realize that he wasn't quite as right as he thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to one other thing that comes to mind, and and that's the uh, lay back and enjoy it approach. Okay, so we have humanity that likes to kill. I mean, it's, it, it, it isn't in the Ten Commandments for no reason. It's there because, because that's humanity. And so, but, but it will probably, likely, continue to kill. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the world of wars will probably continue to go on and all these strategical maneuvers and uh, taking, uh, taking uh, opportunities as a result probably will continue. And no organization will rise either in power or money or, or um, you know, ideological approach um, to stop that. So maybe you and I ought to just agree that it 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 will be what it will be, uh, and it's not a matter of um, peace through war. It's just a matter of uh, letting this whole process play out. Maybe. Maybe, you know, it will. I mean, I th well, I think the likelihood is, short of some dramatic change, it will play out just this way. And all these wars and other destructive events um, will have uh, an effect on humanity and the world going forward. It will be different. You know, Russia could control Europe. China could control all of Asia. The U.S. could, could shrink to a, a small town somewhere in Ohio. Um, you know, I mean, maybe just this is the way things are meant to be, and that we can struggle and strain and make our mistakes, you know, use our various systems the best we can. But at the end of the day, the world is going to change. It is changing. Just relax. Um, yep. You know, I have, a, I have a, a theory about the stock market I want to throw in on you. It's okay. called the fatigue theory, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. And the fatigue theory works this way. The stock market goes up until it gets tired of going up. And then it goes down. And then it's down. But then after a while, it gets tired of going down. So it comes up. Um, I can't tell you when these cycles will take place. If I could do that, that would be better. But <laughs> bottom yeah, line is there's a, here. <laughs> there's a natural order. It isn't yeah. a liberal order. It isn't, you know, an autocracy, autocratic order. It's just the order of things. And yes, you know, while we have this discussion, while these wars take place, while we evolve as a as a species and as a global society, okay, climate change is going to bust us good because <laughs> we're not doing anything on that either. But query, what about that possibility? Lay back, enjoy. It is what it is. Yeah, no, well, there's something to be said for that. I mean, and that's when you, you know, when you look at, at history, you know, and the proportion of people killed in, in conflict from, I don't know, time immemorial, you can find a, a graph that will show it's been fairly steady. That, that uh, you know, I, I gave you the number, the Cornell Peace Studies said 41 million 
since uh, since 1945. Yet we're still all here. We're still enjoying uh, nice weather and uh, peaceful seas in Hawaii. Uh, you know, so there's something to be said for that. That 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 it, it it as long as it doesn't rise to the level of personal inconvenience, then yeah, why not just sit back and enjoy it? The the problem is is that you know what what happens when it knocks on your door. <laughs> It will rise to a level of personal inconvenience, maybe yeah. the biggest inconvenience of all, like you're right. gone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's something to be said for that, and, you know, and, and um, you know, it, it, maybe it is just the order of things that, that you know, civilizations rise and fall. You know, I mean, if you look at, you, you were saying the United States turns into uh, a town in Ohio, you know, maybe it turns into a U.K., you know, where where you don't forget, you know, a couple hundred years ago, the UK was pretty much uh, the position of, uh, of global power, you know, and today that's probably not so much true. Anymore. You know, yeah. so, so, you know, so maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's what we're witnessing. And, and we, if, if we were here a hundred years from now, we, we recognize the historicity of it. You know, but I, I think Carl, there's really two, two roads here. Uh, one is, um, you know, uh, as just discussed, um, you know, sort of letting the natural organic process take place, um, you know, and if the if the global deity, whatever deity that is, um, does not want the Armenian people to survive, well, okay, they won't survive. That'll be that, just the way it goes. And other many other groups, by the way, in in the list I, wrote, I read before, mm -hmm. uh, that's one way, and and and. Uh, the people who who die, you know, you know, what do they say? The survivors tell the history, not the ones mm -hmm. who disappeared. Um, and I think, you know, that's the, the way it could work, and maybe it will work. The other way is we is we make a Herculean effort, and we needs to be defined. We make a Herculean effort to try to control this and do and care for each other and do do those moral things that came out of you know, our history so far, at least the, you know, the ideal moral points, and, um, and try to make a better world for everybody alive, rather than have all these people die and disappear on the historical framework. Um, I tend to think it's the first that will prevail, but what are your thoughts about the second and how we could achieve? We You'd have to help me with the defining we. Yeah, again, uh, the we, the we becomes the real, the real problem because because the we tends to be state based, and and states tend to be very self interested in the end, you know. And so, so can you can you really get beyond this this state based decision making at a, at a global level? <clears throat> and um, for for as long as I can remember, and back to the let's pick fourteen hundred sixty six or something, we can say uh, that the state has been the the preeminent decider of of global affairs, and and states have not they've they've proven to create some stability inside the state, but once you get states trying to work together, they haven't done a very good job for sure. Uh, and and so I, I think you're I think you're right that uh, you know short of some some cataclysmic event it's going to be very difficult to see how we would move beyond what we have today uh, in terms of, of global decision making you know now maybe maybe climate change becomes such a threat that people recognize it as a global threat and and we collaborate you know the in in honor of uh, in honor of COP twenty eight in Dubai today, uh, let's say yes, that's, yes. it certainly doesn't look like it's going to happen this year. You know, <laughs> no. but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but but maybe maybe that's what it takes is is some some external threat. You know, maybe there's a meteor out there waiting to I impact in uh, in Nebraska. You know, and and that's going to change how people see the world. But I mean, again, there you know, it's this this big cataclysm. Is that what it's going to take? To actually get serious about it, and and uh, I mean, having having lived a few years myself, I, I'm sort of inclined to see that it may not happen in my lifetime. That it's going to change. Yeah, well, we know that the only thing certain is change, and well, uh, and death, <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And I, I really wonder whether people will uh, collectively realize that it's in their interest um, to, to collaborate. It's, it's a biblical question. And, uh, you know, wh whether we resolve it uh, or not, it's, it's an open question. And, and we know that the world will change. And maybe, just maybe, we can be optimistic to say that at some point in the future, after a certain number of people have disappeared and a certain number of historical threads have disappeared, uh, we will be wiser. But I would, re I would revise my comment about the way through peace is through war. I would, listening to this discussion, I would say the way to peace is through, is through tragedy and cataclysm, uh, catastrophe, one kind or another. And um, I, I, think, I think that's a more realistic approach. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that that, that may be right. And, and if we can prevent wars, well, then that's that's good, because then we can be prepared for the other kinds of cat cataclysms that are likely to happen. Uh, but, you know, I, I mean, I think I think it's a noble cause to to think about at least how we how we do prevent wars from becoming bigger or from becoming from starting at all. But but, but beyond that, yeah, to prevent them from from escalating, from becoming bigger. And that may be as big a challenge as as we the global society can really take on. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Barbara Tuckman's book, uh, uh, Winds, uh, no, not Winds of War, uh, the, 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 uh, the one about World War I. Oh, Guns of August. Guns of August, uh, where it was, she made it clear that everybody was ready for war. They had their war machines, they had their armies ready, they had their battle plans ready. And it was just a, a little bit of a thing in Sarajevo that just started chain reaction and all that, and millions of people died. Um, and, and when when I see that the United States is spending, what is it, seventy billion, a hundred billion, or maybe it's more. Um, I what try seven hundred? Yeah. Sorry, I was just a. Yeah, <laughs> it, when Eric, Eric Durson says a hundred billion here, hundred billion. <laughs> just, never yeah, pretty mind. soon, it's real money. <laughs> So, you know, I'm thinking that if you put that kind of money into developing weapons and ar armies and whatnot, uh, the the uh, inclination, the, the, the seductive possibility is to use those things. After all, you have an investment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, who, uh, Secretary of State uh, Madeleine Albright very famously said, what good is a military if you don't use it? Oh God! What a statement! She should she should wash her mouth out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, Carl. Any final thoughts from this discussion? No, you tried to depress me early on a Monday here. I think uh, you know, I, uh, but I, I want to. Uh, you know, I think I think I, it's a good discussion because I think it it really points to the fact that that you can only do so much and. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't do anything, and I think that that's really maybe the maybe the, the story that that uh, the professor is trying to teach us here is that it it is a, it is a, a, a global. A, a, I want to say this right. I want to say global a war of globe at war, and and so there's a lot of opportunities to make it better, to try to make it better, to try to reduce the impact of wars. Yeah, okay. And, and sorry I said this, but uh, there's also the opportunity to make more wars. The list that I read at the outset uh, could double. Who knows? Uh, so we should follow that um, when, we, when we can. Yeah, yeah. I think try to reduce them, try to make them small. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. All right. Thank <laughs> Carl you. Baker, Senior Advisor to Pacific Forum. Thank you so much for joining me for this very interesting discussion and very timely and actually a very very profound in its own way. Thank you so much. Thanks. Aloha.